Welcome to Liberty Unlocked. I'm your host, Don Watkins. There's this famous quote usually attributed to Teddy Roosevelt, though who knows if he actually said it, that people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. And it's such a cliche, but there's something really right about it. The way it's usually interpreted is that the audience wants to know you care about them before they're willing to listen to what you have to say. And like there's probably some truth to that. But there's another element that I think is probably more important, which is that they want to know how much you care about what you're talking about, which brings me to today's guest. Yaron Brook is the former executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute and host of the Yaron Brook Show. He's also my longtime book collaborator on Free Market Revolution and Equals Unfair, and uh, the, the latest one being In Pursuit of Wealth. He's also one of the best public speakers I know. We cover a lot of ground in this interview, from the State of the Liberty movement to what we can learn from public intellectuals like Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson or Tyler Cowen, to our biggest regret about our book, Equal is Unfair. But mainly we talked about how to be an effective public speaker, and Yaron's advice in that area was really excellent, particularly his point about why he believes that harnessing your own passion for your subject is one of the most transformative things you can do as an advocate for liberty. And now, on to the conversation. Yeah, so thanks for coming on. Sure, happy to. Yeah, um, uh, usually I start with kind of people's discovery stories, and you have a really interesting one, but before we get that, because I, I mean, like, in general, I like to ask questions that I don't know the answer to, and I, I know your story, but yeah, we should you come back to it because it's. Um, but I'm curious as to your your view of where the liberty movement, if you want to put it that way, is today, positive and negative. Oh, the liberty movement, to the extent that there is one, um, I think it's in deep trouble. <laughs> um, I I think that it is that. What it has failed to do is capture the imagination of young people. And I think, uh, I, and I don't exactly know why, and it, it, it's something I struggle with to try to figure out what's going on. But I think that what has happened since Trump was elected, what's happened over the last four years, it probably happened earlier, but, but at least I've noticed it over the last four or five years, maybe a year before Trump, was that you know, we've always known the left had the certain appeal to young people and, and there was a certain appeal to of a radical. It's weird because I don't think the left is radical, but but the, because they're so conventional. But but this the, 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 there was this appeal to young people of being outside the mainstream and crazy and and and, uh, and different and uh, motivated to to into action. I think what's happened over the last five years and certainly over the last four years is that there has, there's now a, a right-wing equivalent to that that's fundamentally anti-liberty. Uh, so I think that what, is, what appears sexy at universities right now is kind of the, the, the identity Marxist left, identity politics Marxist left, and the counter, which is kind of an alt-right or nationalist right or even religious right, which I think is... is, is has captured the imagination of people in ways that I would have, that, that has surprised me and I did not expect. And I think that, you know, the libertarian, libertarian or broader kind of conservative free market types, they're disappearing and they seem to be disappearing fast. Um, and it, the intellectual support for these people is also going as the conservative movement is splintering and that, the, the, the people who tend to be pro-free markets tend to be, uh, uh, that group is smaller and smaller and smaller and the dominant voices within the conservative movement are, uh, are nationalist and you know, xenophobic and, uh, and you know, just, just build walls. And, uh, and then the libertarians just seem to have kind of, I, I don't know, there they doesn't seem to be energy there. And I think it's the same thing. I think, Again, what's capturing young people is, is these ideas about nationalism and these ideas about identity politics, like in the left, rather than the ideas of liberty and freedom and free markets. Those, those seem, I think, in many people's heads, those seem to be conventional. Those seem to be yeah. 
neoliberal, they call it. Like those are the ideas that we tried in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And they clearly failed. And now we need something different. And uh, we have not managed to convey the radical nature of our ideas and how different they are from everything else that's out there and how uh, how exciting they are and how you know it, it it just it just hasn't caught on for for i'm sure we'll get into the reasons for that but but it just hasn't ca- caught on and well, i uh, think well i mean one thing i've noticed so i noticed this you know going back six seven years ago which is just most of what was happening amongst people you would classify as at least you know generally free market thinkers is it all felt very boring and recycled. There wasn't a lot of new things being said or done. And what was happening to the culture and to the economy, there were new issues, new problems. And so kind of repeating what, you know, Hayek said 50 years ago didn't seem very relevant to people. And the people who were actually commenting on what seemed to be going on today, um, they seem to be relevant in a way that the free market people weren't being relevant. And so people were, you know, like let's, t- let's, let's at least let's listen to the people who are speaking to us where we are. And so I think that's part of why these ideas just seem like, Oh yeah, like that's kind of old stuff. It's because they were just repeating what was, you know, what, what arose universal principles, but the particular ways in which they were argued for and applied arose during a context that didn't seem as relevant in, you know, the 2000s as it did in the 70s. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. But I think on top of that, they bought into, and and I saw that when we were doing our stuff on inequality, so many of the people we would have thought would have been our allies bought into the inequality rhetoric and, and, and then try to explain how, you know, I think Rand Paul did it in one of the debates. He said something like, oh, but in capitalism, we have less inequality. And like, nobody right. believes that. That's just, that's, who, who, you know, so, and I think so, and I noticed that, you know, I remember I was at a Mont Pelerin Society meeting. And, uh, you know, Mont Pelerin is this place, for those of you listening who might not know, uh, of, of, you know, really the top minds and the top thinkers in the kind of free market movement. Uh, both on the conservative and libertarian sides, and a lot of economists, primarily economists. Now, remember the, the opening talk was by Pete Betke, who I like, who is a good guy, and is a. And he, one of the problems he's citing is that exists in the world is inequality, <laughs> and it was like, really, Pete, you know better than that. You know that's not true. And when I gave my talks, I gave a talk, and I get on stage, and I, he, Pete was sitting right in front of me, and I, and I, basically in front of all these prestigious people, like. I chastised him. I said, how could you do that? Because the talk was an inequality. I said, even the president of the society thinks it's a problem. And we all know it's not a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. We shouldn't even buy. And they, it, it was like, yeah, Pete said, yes, you're right, you're on. But then they yawned and they went on. It was like, they, there's a resistance. Well, there's a resistance to Ayn Rand, which I think is, is a big part of why they're losing, why the liberty movement is losing. I think the more they resist her, the more they will lose. But there's a, there's a resistance to being radical, to being really challenging, not just in the economic. Too many of the people in the liberty movement are too enamored by their own cleverness. And this, you know, by their own, oh, we know how to, you know, you see this in, in almost all of them. And they're not really addressing, okay, what is it going to take to actually change the world? That's not what they're thinking about. They're too involved in the internal of what's going on among them. And, and appearing to be really, really smart uh, within their own movement. Yeah, I mean, my one, I don't know that I'd call it a regret, but I think there is a lost opportunity. Uh, so I I have a very positive opinion of our, our book equals unfair. Um, and I think, I mean, we were the first ones with a free market view to come along and challenge Piketty. But th- what I didn't see, and I think became clear about a year or two after the book came out, was, you know, we delimited to focus on the economic side of it. But w- what has become clear is that so many of the cultural elements of the kind of left versus right debate are really at the forefront of people's thinking and their understanding of where is the world and where is it going and who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And so we bring in the wider context of this is part of egalitarianism. Um, 
and you know it's hard to write a uh, a book even oh, as delimited as you know w- 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 to delimit our book was a pain but I, I i do wish that we had brought the wider context because in part what it does is it shows you can't deal with these issues without philosophy it's not just economics and 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 we do that but um i think you know the, we could if you think about how the inequality debate came and played out, it became much more focused on, you know, the cultural egalitarianism, the identity politics, uh, you know, race, sex, class, well, class and, just being one element of it. And the way that the way that the right has responded, I, I do, you know, I, 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 I think the right is the real enemy. So I, I do a lot of, I re- read a lot of this, these new right kind of types and one of the ways they've responded to the inequality debate is saying, no, no, we're for inequality, but they don't, but they think of it not the way we think of it in terms of freedom. They think of it, no, people have different levels of IQ. So the smart people should be, you know, are better than the dumb people. Or, you know, uh, it, it, in every respect, they want to create hierarchies. And the hierarchies are not based on anything real or anything, or anything, um, and, and the hierarchies are based on a rejection of freedom, fundamental rejection of freedom. And so they're attacking the, even the political equality. So they're even attacking the quality of the Declaration of Independence. And so what you have now is a group on the left who, who, who claims egalitarianism, but really, you know, they want to suppress everybody except for themselves. They want, to, they want to hold anybody of virtue down. They want to destroy the good. And then you've got on the right, People who want to destroy the good in the name of their own superiority, which comes to, uh, which comes from non-essential characteristics, and it's it really is becoming quite sickening. And we have this nuance, and this is what I'm also discovering. I think in the last few years, I've discovered, <laughs> I you know, nuance doesn't play well, right? And we have a mm-hmm. nuanced view. We're saying no, there is such a thing as political equality, and that's a virtue. But there's these other view, ways in which people use equality that's bogus. And like people can't hold that. Either it's good or it's bad, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we can't have uh, and, and any kind of, you know, Rand, it always surprised me that Rand makes a, there's a, this big deal that Leonard and, and I make of, you know, everybody thinks in twos and our position is something different than the two that they have. It's like, okay, but why do people think in twos? That can't be right. That, that's, but it is. People cannot think beyond two possibilities. There's no like nuance to their thinking or there's no possibility of a third real alternative. And that's, that's been a real shock. Uh, and again, it's, it's part of how we frame the debate that I don't, the more we know about the opposition, the more we can frame the debate to counter it. But, uh, but yeah, inequality, I think we would do it differently today because you would have to take into account these other issues, these cultural issues, and both the attacks on the left and on the right on them. Well, one point, I don't think we made it in the book, but Ayn Rand made this point in passing once that I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting, but I never really paused on it, which is she is adamant in rejecting the concept of meritocracy, yes. which I think would, would shock people. Like, well, isn't her whole argument, but she takes it as like, no, theocracy is a meaning and it's rule by merit. So the idea that you're going to line up people by IQ and they should be at the top, that that's the complete wrong way to think about it is that yep. you have ruled by a principle of individual rights. And then there's going to be hierarchies, some of which are based on merit, some of them are going to be based on uh, whatever the legitimate you know, criteria is in a certain area. Some of them will be illegitimate hierarchies, but that like, you, we're not arguing for rule by merit. And if you're talking about kind of merit rising to the top in a free market, that's not rule. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, and, and so you need to keep separate those two things. And, yeah, uh, and the whole concept of rule is, I mean, is a, is, is a, is a perverted, con- it's, it's a dangerous concept. I mean, you know, the rule of individual rights, it's not exactly rule in the sense that people understand it because rule is power. Um, but the individual rights is also another one of these um, concepts that I, I'd always assumed. Okay, so there's certain people, they might not quite get the concept of individual rights, but they're generally on the individual rights side. And now I'm a lot more skeptical about whether anybody's on the individual rights side, right? That, that there is this body. I, I, more and more I see people 
walking away from the idea of individual rights, rejecting it. Uh, more people on the right are criticizing the founding fathers or rejecting the founding fathers. Oh, that was good for the 18th century, but it's not good for the 21st. Um, and, uh, and, and those people are getting, are getting attention among the young, the whole um, social media and memes and, and uh, all of that, you know, has, has changed the intellectual debate and has made it superficial and shallow so that a concept like individual rights where you actually have to explain what it means because nobody knows it's hard to convey and it's hard to, it's hard to really get across to people. Um, and people just, they turn off from sophisticated, complex, um, philosophical arguments. They yeah, want, they want a soundbite. I, I, that's definitely true. I mean, it used to be when I started out, uh, you could get a lot of mileage by appealing to the founders. Like, you know, you could connect with most audiences that way. And today I don't feel like that at all. Often you're guaranteeing that you're going to get a backlash from both sides and a blank stare from the people who aren't outright hostile, uh, which I think is really tragic. But I also think, you know, the, the right way to employ rights, not in your thinking, I think in your thinking, um, the, the, it should be central to thinking about political issues, but the way that you use it in persuasion, I think people often get wrong and it's tricky to do because it's sort of the, the way that most people argue, I call it logical brute force. This is particularly bad amongst subjectivists, but it's wider than there, which is like, I'm going to start out with a, a starting point that I'm pretty sure my audience will agree with. And then I'm going to like f create an argument that nobody could object to. Yep. And the, and that doesn't work at all. And then if they're a little bit more sophisticated, they'll go, well, no, first I'm going to give an argument for individual rights, and then I'm going to use that to drag people to the conclusion that we have to reject social security. And if you notice, Ayn Rand does not operate that way. You're never kind of being dragged from a principle to a conclusion. Uh, it's she, w the, the, the feeling I get from reading her, and this is where it became like my central idea of what is the ideal persuasive piece of content, whether a speech or an article, is that the end you feel like the conclusion is overwhelmingly obvious. So like you start out reading her take on the draft and by the end, it's not like, well, individual rights say we can't have the draft. By the end of it, you're like, oh my God, how could I have ever been confused about how monstrous this is? And so like, if you're, if the more that you're using rights as kind of like, well, you can't just, I mean, you don't want to abandon the concept of rights versus you're using rights to illuminate how destructive a given policy is and how liberating an alternative policy is, then like that's the cash money if you can do it. But rights by itself doesn't hold a lot of uh, power for people today, unfortunately. Well, and I think every, any abstraction like that, you have to lead people to it. You can't, you can't prove it and then assume it because the proof is far too complex and it requires too many integrations and too much induction for anybody in the audience to get it. So you're not proving, one of the things, you're not proving anything in a talk. You don't prove anything in a talk. You indicate, you give a suggestion, you point people in the right direction, right? Maybe in an article, you can really prove eight points. But an article is, is much better in that sense because people can read it and think about it and reread it. And, but in a talk, you cannot do that. You're not, you're not even going to do what you can in, a, in an article. I remember being criticized for doing a talk on capitalism and never mentioning the concept of individual rights, right? How can you do that? That's, and it's what's the point of the talk? The point is not to cover, to checkbox every one of the of the, you know, the hierarchy within objectivism that leads one to capitalism. The point is to draw people into thinking about this in a different way and to go and do their own thinking and go do their own research because you're not going to give them the answer right there and then in the talk. Um, but, but people have a dogmatic way of thinking about these things and they have checkboxes that they need to check off in well, the way they present. I definitely wanted to talk to you about speaking because, I mean, this is obviously, I think it's your strongest ability um, although m most people don't know, like you were not always really great on the stage. I mean, you know, like people can go up and look online, uh, at the talks you're giving in like 2006, 2007. And first of all, they're all written out. Yep. Um, and you still come across as, you know, a, a likable person and everything yep. like that. But 
a lot of your personality is suppressed because it's tied to... Well, it comes on the Q&A. The Q&A was like a thousand times better than the speech. So I want to get to that evolution, but I definitely agree. Th- I mean, my own version, my own view about what a, a talk is supposed to do, it's supposed to make people interested in you, the speaker, enough to pay attention to you over a longer span of time where you can start to build an argument. Because I've, I mean, I've seen a lot of people who have said they came to objectivism from, you know, hearing you and paying attention to you. But it's almost never that they said it was one talk or one event. It was always, I started listening, you know, watching your stuff on YouTube. It's maybe they would hang around and, you know, so it's, it's this combination of things and that's absolutely the case. You can't, you're not, you know, I always say it's, it's for them to follow me and for them to read Ayn Rand. That's my goal. It's not to convince them of X. It's not to prove X. And I don't think you could go into a talk thinking that you've got to, it, it, talks are, I mean, in some sense, I mean, they're educational. See, hopefully you're saying stuff that's going to interest them and going to spark that. Otherwise you don't get the second, the other effect. But talks are really marketing tools in some sense, right? They're, they're ways to get the marketing of yourself and broadly your ideas. So in my case, marketing I meant. And if, 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 if 10% of the audience then goes and reads Ayn Rand or, or starts following me on YouTube or something like that, then it's been a success, right? But I, these polls where how many people walked in thinking X and how many people <laughs> walked out thinking Y, no, I mean, if anybody changed their mind, it, 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 I, what I'd like is if somebody walked in with the opposite view that they left confused. That would be huge success, right? That I challenged enough of their existing beliefs for them to be not confused. But if I actually convince somebody, then I'm suspicious of them, right? Of, of, yeah. of, of, of their thinking. So you have to set your sights. And, and part of the evolution in speaking style is to get to figure out your purpose. Why are you speaking? What, what's, what's the goal of the, of the talk? And, and, I, and I think there's been a lot of confusion among intellectuals broadly and among objectivist intellectuals in terms of what is the purpose of a talk. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, Ayn Rand was adamant that she was not, did not view herself as a speaker. She was, her job, her goal was always just to promote Atlas Shrugged, which is why she would even, and do talks, but they were essentially articles that she would read. And I mean, incredible articles. Um, And then, you know, Leonard. Can you imagine sitting in an audience and hearing her talk, doing the talk, what is capitalism? (laughs) I mean, I read that talk every few months or every couple of years or something. And I'm blown away every time by how much I didn't get last time and how much I need to read certain paragraphs twice, three times. I still don't get certain parts of that article completely. And if that was just delivered orally, I would, she would have lost me completely. I, you know, I, I might have stayed intrigued because there's so much content there that's so interesting, but I wouldn't got anything out of it. And, and generally, I, you know, I commit this heresy, but I don't think she was a good public speaker. She, I, I don't think she gave one great talk, and that was uh, uh, Philosophy Who Needs It. That is the one article she wrote that is actually a good talk. But everything else are not good talks. They, they're the greatest articles may be ever written, but they're not good talks. And, or, or if she delivered um, the objectivist ethics as a talk, which she did. You know, you had a hard enough time reading it, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a different skill set and different purpose than I think an article. Well, so, yeah. And so part of what's interesting to me is, so, uh, you know, she was not viewing herself as a speaker and then Leonard Peikoff, who was, you know, her, her best student, uh, he's an incredible teacher. What, yeah. I mean, probably the best teacher I've had in any subject. Um, but I don't. Th- but I don't think he's a speaker in the sense that we mean going out to a cold audience and trying to win them over. I don't think he would consider himself that. And so we have these two models that, if to go to your point, if you're not clear on what is the purpose of speaking, um, you can model people who are not. They're doing something very different. And and so it was. I don't think really until. I mean, I think you were the first uh, objectivist I know who was really doing what I think you should be doing in a talk, which is just trying to connect with the audience, make some intriguing points and start, you know, spark some of them to go on that journey. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, cause I don't know the details of it. What, what was the evolution like for you internally? Like what, when did you realize I need to do something different and, and how did it go from, you know, zero to a hundred? So, yeah. So, so when I started doing 
I mean, I was a teacher first, so um, teaching is, but I viewed public speaking as different and, and much more intimidating than teaching. Teaching, I could go in cold and, 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 and cover material I knew well without a lot of notes and without, but when I started, when I started uh, speaking on, uh, you know, on, on topics related to objectivism, I used to write out and people would, would help me write out whole talks and, and they would be long, you know, 20,000 words or something. I mean, and, and we'd have to figure out my pace and sometimes I would have to read them really fast because we only had an hour, but you had to get out the content, right? You couldn't cut anything, right? God forbid, because it was, so it, it, it was, it was, so I, I tried to do the best that I could at that. And I was decent at it. I'm certainly, you know, the master at reading a talk is Leonard, you know, and he's brilliant at it. And, and he makes you feel like, you know, he's, he's, he's extemporaneous, but it's all written out there. And he, you know, and, and there's some other people like Tara Smith is pretty good at, at, is really good at reading a talk while keeping you engaged and really interacting with the audience. Um, but from the beginning, I mean, so from the beginning, I was, I was, I enjoyed the Q and A's much more, but the thing that kept me writing it was this, I, I mean, basically the fear. I mean, it, it, I was intimidated into thinking that here I was, I was the CEO of the Ironman Institute. I was speaking on her behalf in some way. And God forbid I say something wrong, right? That I, that I, that I articulate, you know, in Q and A, everybody accepts that, that that's a different category, right? So, but in a talk you had a, it had to be right. And of course, Leonard was the model and, 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 you know, everything was clearly defined and clearly articulated and every sentence was true. So the standard was not, am I communicating with the audience? Am I getting anything through to the audience? The standard was, is this true? And am I doing a decent job delivering this truth to the audience? And it never quite felt right. Um, and, and over the years, first of all, this idea that I enjoyed the Q and A's more, the audience enjoyed the Q and A's. The audience would always come up to me afterwards and say, oh, I love that answer. I love the Q and A or whatever. They never compliment the talk. Um, <laughs> And I thought the talks were good in terms of the content, but, but, but they couldn't retain it. Nobody retained it. Anyway, the, the way this evolved, so I was already thinking about this. So why can't I do it like I'm teaching? But then I would, it would scare me, right? So I would, I would be too intimidated to do it. And, and uh, you know, but what if I say something wrong, basically, is, was, the, was the idea. And, 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 and you know how many rounds of editing those talks, you know, went through. I mean, hours and hours spent on every word, on every paragraph. And some of them became uh, articles. So that's great, right? So, but some of them didn't. Some of them just wasted in a sense that we spent all this time delivered once. Some of them are not even on video or something. Delivered once and they're gone. And yet hours and hours and hours were spent on them. And so I was doing, we were doing media training. Um, and I don't know if you, I don't remember if it was, uh, PJ, JP, something like that. PJ Walker. PJ Walker. We're doing uh, just as a quick Walker. aside, I, I got in this news program where they had me like debate a guest about something and it got really heated. I mean, the guy was just like saying these outrageous things and being really cruel. And afterwards, when I saw it go on YouTube, it was TJ. Like he turned out to be a radical progressive and was yeah. being like the worst <laughs> like the, the, the most dishonest debater ever. And I was like, hey, that's the guy who taught me how to do media. Exactly. So yes, years later, I discovered how much of a leftist he was. And here he was hearing all this objectivist stuff being delivered. It must have freaked him out. Um, so he, get, he did a media training for, for television and for others. I mean, I participated, but a bunch of people from the Institute participated. And at some point, I think he said, you know, uh, I also do public speaking training. I said, well, you know, I'm a pretty good speaker. You know, I, I don't know. What I need. He said, well, let me, let me see a video. And so I sent him a video and said, yeah, you, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and he asked me a question and it, it's the question turned everything on. He said, why do you give speeches? What's the purpose? And by then I'd already was questioning what I was doing and everything, but that basically said, yeah, why am I giving speeches? And I said, well, I, I want to communicate certain ideas to people. And he said, nobody's getting the ideas you're trying to communicate. And I said, nah, that can't, you know, you're just exaggerating. That's not true. And he said, okay, let's do an experiment. And he got, he, so he got, he got a random staff member in the studio there. And he said, okay, 
take take a standard thing and do 20 minutes and then but th and then we'll ask him what he what he learned so he did that and we asked him what he learned and, and whatever it was it was completely different than what i delivered it was not what i wanted him to learn so he said you can't do this right you 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 too much content you're condensing it they no, they don't know what to focus on. They don't know what's important and what's not important. They don't, they don't know what you're, what you're trying to convey. And we went through this. You know, you can't, you can't present more than X amount of content. You can't present more than one overarching point and maybe three points in the middle. You can't do more than that. And if you try, then you just lose the audience. And then he also said, and if you, if, 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 so we got to the point where my point was what I'm trying to do is communicate with the audience. I'm trying to make create a relationship with the audience. He said, and you think by sticking your head in a piece of paper, you're doing that. And I said, no, I know I'm not, but, but, but he said, forget the buts. Who cares if you're exactly right? Who cares about the formulation? So basically it was TJ who he didn't, I didn't do much. I didn't need much training at that. So once he said that it clicked and once I tried it, I was good at it. And once I tried it, it made complete sense to me. And, and he would say things like, the most you should ever take on stage with you is a sheet of paper with three bullet points, just in case you forget one of them, right? And I literally used to do that in the, so I think this was around 2008. So I literally used to take a piece of paper with three bullet points, big type, and I used to put it on the floor. He taught me that. You put it on the floor. So as you're walking on the stage, you, it's right there in front of you. You don't have to go to a podium to look at your notes. They're right in front of you on the floor. Nobody knows they're on the floor. Nobody can see them. And you're not squinting because it's a big type and it's only three points. And that's how I started. And of course, you know, within a few months, I stopped needing that piece of paper and, and uh, got the confidence not to need that anymore. But it changed everything because suddenly, suddenly now the question becomes, um, well, am I communicating? So I, my goal is communicating with the audience. Okay, so I'm looking at them now. Oh, well, now I can actually measure whether they're responding. Are they responding to what I'm saying? Is, is there a connection? Is there any kind of interaction going on? And then you start, okay, that joke worked. That story worked. That, that one didn't. That went flat completely. This closing didn't work. That opening, you actually are getting feedback, which is you don't have when you're reading a talk. And usually when you read a talk, you give it once. I mean, you, you don't give it many times. Well, if you notice feedback and you have a written talk, it's the worst thing on earth because you can't do anything about it. I can't do it right now. And I, I need to remember and I, then I have to do all the editing and all the changes. And it's too difficult. It's too hard. But here I can just remember that this worked that didn't work. And next time I do it, I can, I can try something different. And when you get really good at it, then you view every time you give a talk as a little experiment and you're willing to even try something new and you're willing to fail because you know that that'll help you do it better next time. So your whole, the whole attitude, the whole way you think about giving a talk changes. And, and of course, the more you do it, the more comfortable you become and the more you can play with it. And so that today, particularly when I give a talk, I'm really have given a lot of times, every aspect of the talk I'm in control of. So, you know, one of the things when you, when you do, uh, you know, I know you did it. I, I, I was terrible at it. Some other people we know do it is you pace, right? You, you, you don't have notes, but you're pacing as you're, as you're delivering a talk. And that's it's terrible. The, the audience doesn't like it. It's, it's unless you do it. And, and, but it's hard to know what to do with your body. There's a little bit of nerves. There's a little bit of, the ideal is to get to the point where every movement you make on stage has a purpose. And, and you can get this. So when I give a, a talk that I give, like my morality of capitalism talk, pretty much every move I make, like I, I, I've, I've said this in other, other places, but like my left hand, whenever I raise my left hand, that's egoism. Like Bill Gates is over here, capitalism is over here, production, creation, building, you know. And this is, this is altruism. And everything related to altruism, from Mother Teresa to everything else is this hand, right? And, and if I want to emphasize a point, I walk towards the audience. And if I want them to relax a little bit, I walk away from the audience. I walk backwards. And if I'm pacing, I pace in, in a way as to look at this portion of the audience and that portion of the audience, but not monotonically. And that's, that's communication. You're actually getting feedback from the audience and you're communicating with them. And now you've got them in your hand. You're kind of 
playing with them because you, you, you know how they'll react to different things after you do it for a while. So that's where you want to get to in that form of communication. Yeah, I mean, that's very similar to like the best stand-up comedians I know. It's that, you know, you're, you have your kind of worked out material that you've really honed and then you're going to introduce a new piece of it. You play around with where it is. You play around with the wording. So you just have this constant experiment in stage. And, and they also have this presence on stage. They really good, really good stand-up comedians. They know when to sit on a stool, when to stand, when to walk, when to pace, when to look directly in the audience, and when, and when to pause. Pause is, is huge in comedy. It's crucial in comedy, but it's also crucial in communication. That's my number one speaking tip to people. Like, all right, if I'm going to give you one thing and I can only have 10 seconds, it's just pause more than you think you should, longer than you think you should, and you'll instantly be a better speaker. Particularly when you ask a question. One of the most frustrating things to hear a speaker ask the audience a question and immediately go into the, reply, the answer or into whatever he wants to go. But the whole point of asking a question in a talk is to cause people to think. Well, well, you know, why is capitalism uh, viewed as immoral? You know, whatever, right? You want them to get them thinking about it. And then you want to, that now becomes a context for what you're going to say. But if they don't have time to think about it, then it's useless to ask the question. So whether it's a rhetorical question or real question doesn't matter, you always want to pause and give people time to think after you ask a question. But yes, pausing is a, is, is, and slowing down generally, people, people speak too fast, um, is, is, is really important. Well, one thing I learned from you that you do really well is that, so you talked about having the three points, but I think a big, a big focus of you is like, you have very engaging ways of making each point. So it's not like I say this abstract point, it's some kind of story, analogy, anecdote, um, how do you like think, first of all, do you have a way that you come up with that? Or is that just sort of stuff that pops into your mind accidentally? Or, um, and then how, how do you uh, go about using them effectively? Because I, 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 that's my favorite thing to do is when I can come up with a really good one. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it varies. So if it's a brand new talk, I have to think about it. And I don't know that I have a methodology. I read a lot about the topic and uh, or around the topic and then i think about it and then i but a lot of it i let my subconscious i let you know it's it's one of those things where often it'll come to me in the morning or it'll come to me late at night when i'm thinking about it it'll just pop into my head oh that's a that's a good example i hear a story and i'll go oh that would fit in there so so when i'm i'm consciously Trying to get at it when I'm trying writing a new talk or when I'm do, do, tr- figuring out a new talk, but and the more time I have, the the better. So if I st- and it's not so much that I have to work on it, but the more time I think, okay, I'm going to give a talk on X. If I have like three months to just just have it in the background so that the subconscious really can work on it, that's helpful. Um, but what I like is when I've got an existing talk and. You know, it's boring to give exactly the same talk over and over again. And, and, but I don't mind it. And it. But what I like is that I'll encounter something well, and something, oh, that's a good, that's a good example of, of I could stick it in there, right? And what happens with these talks is they become modular, right? And the examples are modular. And so what I try to do now is think, so now you could, you could basically – tell me that I have to give a talk in 10 minutes about a topic within a range of topics from foreign policy to variety of different topics in capitalism. And I can pretty much in 10 minutes come up with the three points that I want to make and not even think about the content. The content will just come because the content in us categorized in my subconscious into these modules. And if I have the three points, then there's certain concretes that fit into each one of those points that I can get up you know, so I use the Bill Gates example in a variety of different talks in a variety of different contexts because I can just spin the story a little bit differently, right? And it'll fit. And I have a bunch of those and I keep trying to accumulate more. So when I read something, when I see something interesting, I file it away as, okay, that falls under altruism or that f- a good example of altruism or that falls under a good example of, um, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, businessmen feeling guilty or, 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 or things like that. So there's, so I, I try to think in those, not in terms of talk A, talk B, talk C, talk D. I try to think of topic A, topic B, topic C, topic D, and, you know, point the three points. Those are what's what are important because you can use those three points in a variety of different talks. You can, you can, this is the other thing, and you know this from writing, right? There's no one right outline. There's no, there's no one right way of delivering content. So you can, you can change the order. I could take any talk I give and change the order and make it work. Right? And you can do the same thing by taking points I make in a talk on capitalism into a talk on inequality. And I have like three inequality talks that I can play around with the points. And sometimes I don't even know which inequality talk I'm going to give until I'm actually in the middle of it. And I decide, am I going to do the pie? Because I have a talk on the pies. Or am I going to do, um, you know, Kame Rouge? Or am I going to do, you know, so I've got it. And again, so it's, it's, you've got to create these really great examples, analogies, uh, you know, that, are organized in your subconscious and then rely on your subconscious to feed them to you when the time is right, you know, in, in the right context. So one of the things that is, uh, one of the, the challenges I think is, so I have this, this general view of that people aren't persuaded by ideas. They're persuaded by people. Now there, it's possible to take that the wrong way. Cause I think ultimately it's your processing ideas and you're looking at reality and trying to assess if it's true, but even to get a foothold where somebody's going to consider what you have to say, they want to see a person that particularly if you're talking about giving people philosophic or moral guidance, if you come across as a weird dude who nobody would want to get like be like, then to say, all right, here's my plan for how you should live. Like you're, you're killing it from the get go. And certainly one of the things that, you know, I hear about you very often is even people who wildly disagree with you, find you to be appealing, uh, you know, a, a, a person that is fun to listen to, you know, the kind of person that, you know, you could go have a conversation with for hours. And, um, so to what extent, how do you think about, uh, I mean, with you, I think it's mostly just be, like you said, being on stage, being very in the moment and just letting your, your true self, um, come out versus being kind of tied to, I must get this material out there that's in front of me. But I know you, you also, uh, really like, you know, helping other people develop. Um, how do you think about the role of, uh, helping somebody become, you know, a more likable or more relatable version of themselves when they're on a stage? I think what's important is that people see that you care. I think that's, that's a big part of it, right? So, cause I, sometimes I'm up there and I'm yelling at people, right? And you think they'd hate me for it, but they don't take it as I'm yelling at them. They take it as, wow, this guy really cares. He really is passionate about this. They can see the value. The, the, the value orientation that I have. And I think that that can be learned because we're, you know, objectivists. I mean, we're all valuers, at least the, the better ones, the, the real objective, you know, we care about stuff and they need to see that it's not just an academic exercise. And if going back to the previous topic, I think a lot of libertarians come across as this is an academic exercise. This is kind of cool. Look at me, how smart I am. Or look at me, how cool this stuff is. And it is. And I, I love listening to them because I can get, What's cool about them, but the new person, I think, struggles with that. Um, and I think the most successful speakers, the most successful, and this is why, you know, so you say it's people. I don't know that it's people because, you know, I was convinced by Atlas Shrugged. So, but there's something the same there because. Well, but Atlas Shrugged is, it's ideas embodied in people. People, exactly. And it's values. It's values right there and it's passion and it's, it's a story. So it, 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 that is, I think, what works. So I think what they have to know is that you care and this is your life and it's not just a, a mental exercise and there's something, there's something very value-driven uh, around everything that you do, right? That this is really, this is important to you. You care, then maybe they should care, right? If you, if you don't care, why the hell should they care, right? So it, it, you have to convince them of that and I think that's, that's how your personality comes out. Because if people see what you care about, then they see who you are. 
right? And, and some people will never get it. So some people are clearly offended by me getting a little bit, you know, uh, 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 passionate about stuff. But the better people see it for what it is and, and, and they, they, um, they find that very attractive and interesting. And I, you know, sometimes when I go, you know, after talk and talk to people for hours, you know, I'm surprised sometimes on the, on the kind of stuff that I, you know, I mean, I'm, I can be pretty insulting to them, but it's always done in a way as, no, these ideas are important to me. And if you take ideas that, are, that I find offensive, you're going to hear from me. And they take it as, okay, you know, he's challenging me. They don't take it as he's insulting me. And I, I think it's because it's always about, no, no, this is really important to me. Don't, don't make fun of this. Don't, don't belittle this don't ridicule this because this is these are important things uh and and i think that creates it creates that cognitive dissonance that create that causes them to think that causes them to want to hear more that causes them to be willing to read you know an 1100 page book which is ultimately my goal what are some of the weaknesses that you still struggle with or that you're working to improve on yeah, my biggest weakness, I think, is that I agree to do talks that I shouldn't be doing. Um, uh, you oh, know, I, yeah, I have a, I, 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 just a quick. So I think it was October of two thousand eight, and I somehow got the chance to do a radio interview on you know the cause of the financial crisis, and I didn't really start studying economics until the financial crisis. I had no business giving this interview, and so of course, you know. I give my opening spiel, which I'm sure was just a, a very unclear version of what I heard, you, you know, you and some yeah, other yeah. free market people say. And then, you know, the guy asked a just totally legitimate follow-up question and I'm talking and answering and I know I'm bullshitting. He knows I'm bullshitting. The audience knows I'm bullshitting and we're just waiting for this, this nightmare to end all of us. And yeah. like, if I had just said, you know, honestly, I, I, that's not an area where I have expertise, but um, the one thing I can say is that it shouldn't be blamed on a free market because the one thing we know for sure is there wasn't like if it had just been an honest answer. But the bigger thing is don't <laughs> don't get into those situations in the first place. So, yeah. So my most difficult is when I'm trying to do something that I'm not really that comfortable doing. So um, if it's a philosophical topic and I'm finding myself um, days before I'm supposed to give the talk leafing through OPA and reading everything about the topic to try it. And, I, and my subconscious is like screaming, you don't know this, this you know, you haven't got it. You, oh, you know it, but not in a way that you can deliver, not in a way that you can concretize, not in a way that you're playing to your strengths, you, you know, to do that. I, I can't do it because I'm not a philosopher and I don't have it integrated well enough. I can wing it, but I don't like, wing, I don't like that. And, you know, if I spend enough time, I could probably find a, an angle, an interesting angle on it. But typically, I don't give it enough time, partially because I'm resisting and, you know, going there right. because I know it's hard. So I find the, the more philosophical, the more difficult. And then once in a while, like, I was asked to do something <laughs> for the American Philosophical Association for the Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand Society there years ago. And I was asked to do something on the morality of capitalism. And I could have just done what I do for the world but i thought oh my god this is these are philosophers and it's a philosophical thing i my thing is not philosophy you know so i, I basically gave a 11th grade book review of of quality thing of of what is capitalism right i basically did an outline of what is capitalism delivered that and it was horrible it was terrible it was it was exactly moving away from what i'm good at so it's that's where i struggle um well, what I hope, so one of the best things I've seen you do on the stage in the last couple of years was the two kind of Q&A style or, or discussion style things on art yep. at Ocon. And I know that's in a certain way, it's, it's new material because you don't speak on that a lot. But I mean, you're a huge fan of art. And that was an area where even more than your capitalism stuff, like your genuine enthusiasm came through. And I just remember, I, I thought, a lot of the speakers, Lisa stuff, Ankar's uh, contribution, I found those to be some of the, the best events. And part of what it convinced me of is that 
this point we made about, you know, objectivism has this value of we can talk, we can come at things from a much richer perspective than just politics, even when we're talking about political issues, because there's such a value moral perspective. Um, and I, like, I wanted to see more of that. Like, I think, you know, if we were doing more stuff like that about, you know, enriching your life with art, um, and uh, like that just becomes a, a, a winning message, uh, or winning content for us. It is, although it's hard to get an audience for the message. That's the challenge I find. But, you know, so that, it's interesting how that evolved, right? So I was preparing talk, a talk on art and Anko was preparing a talk on art. We were both, just like with Oprah, we were shuffling through the Romantic Manifesto and reading as much as we could before the conference and trying to figure out. And then we met like two days before the conference and I looked at Anko and said, do you have a talk? Because I don't, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to say. And because it, it was, it was too intimidating. It was like, I had to give a talk on something that Ayn Rand wrote, which is unbelievably deep in its, its psychological, philosophical, and aesthetic components, right? If you read the Romantic Manifesto, and it's one of these books, every time you read it, you discover completely new things about it. So I hadn't read it in a few years and I read it again and I get, oh my God, I can't talk about this. I don't know anything here, right? It's, in many ways, I think it's her hardest book. Yeah, uh, yes. even more than ITOE, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, yeah. um, because it spans epistemology, psychology, aesthetic. Like it's, and she uh, is the expert in this. Remember, she is an artist, right? I am not. So <laughs> she talks about it from the perspective of being an artist. So she can say thing about about what art is that comes from her deep introspection about what she had to go through to create art. That it's hard. Or even when it comes to concept like sense of life, which I think as an artist, you have a different view of than you do as just somebody experiencing art, right? And I mean, not just any artist, but an artist who's a philosopher who can really introspect it and knows this. And then I have to talk about this. I mean, this is, a, this is ridiculous. So basically, we, we decided since neither of us could really give a talk on it, the best thing would be for us to kind of have kind of this kind of not really a Q&A, but for us to feed off of each other and to talk about this and not to make it overly theoretical because the theoretical is in the book, but to make it more how we use this. And I think it did. It really, I think it worked well. I think it, 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 it just was at the right level, philosophical enough, but got a lot of really passion and examples. And, uh, but that's a good example where the talk would be terrible. And, and this was a way to do it. But I do, you know, I do, I try to do once in a while a show right, on my podcast um, on art. And I just did one recently and I showed some painting and I showed some sculpture and I talked about them and I loved it. And, the peop- and a lot of people loved it and it was fun. But, you know, it, I don't know, it got X number of views. And if I'd done that day, if I'd done something on Trump or coronavirus or China or something like that, it would have been 4X views, right? So it's... it's Leonard was asked you know, once about you know, his radio show, why don't you do more positive stuff? And he says, when I do, nobody listens. Exactly. (laughs) Nobody listens. So, but I do find, so I did a talk, I think one of the last public talks I did before this coronavirus thing, I was invited to Dartmouth up in New Hampshire, uh, I think in February. Yeah, it was February and I, it it was snowing. It was, it was, uh, but I gave a talk and then after the talk, I can't even remember what the talk was about. I think it was the morality of capitalism or inequality or something like that. And then after the talk, I went with like a dozen students to a restaurant and we, we just talked. And that's some of the funnest stuff, time I've ever had, you know, I've had. And they had a blast because one of the things I can do, and I think a lot of us can do, but we don't do enough of it, is I can talk about so many different things. I, I can talk about history and I've got a, we've got a very unique perspective on history that students never hear, right? You talk economics, talk politics, but we can talk about art. We talk about sex, about relationships, and so, and you say something about sex that you know most of these kids turned out to be quite religious, which is, you know, I didn't think that I might have not said the things that I said if I'd known in advance. But given their responses, and I'm I'm saying stuff like I'm, I you know over this dinner I'm saying stuff like you know, if you don't have sex before, I think it's immoral not to have sex before marriage, and which I do, and they're like. Oh my God, this guy's, you know, but they were so intrigued because now nobody has ever said that to them. They've never heard anybody say it's not moral not to have sex before marriage. They're, 
that if morality plays into it, then morality has to say, no, you have to wait until after marriage. You know, they can't think otherwise, right? But just to say that you could see the wheels spinning, the objections coming out, but they were thinking in ways that they've never thought in their lives. And I got more satisfaction out of that than anything. And I got a number of emails afterwards saying, oh, the talk was great, but the dinner, that was really cool. We really had a good time on that. And I think it's, 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 you know, the older you get, the more you can do this because the more experiences you have, the more opinions you have and the more things. But we are, as objectivist intellectuals, we're truly unique in the world in terms of the kind of views that we have, the scope of them, and we're radical on everything, we, really on everything. And that makes, that makes us interesting. And I, you're right. And you're right. I mean, I, I wish I knew how to capitalize on that more. So you know who capitalizes on this? Who, who is, but he's, he's eclectic and, we, you know, he's not, is Tyler Cowan, right? Mm -hmm. do, do, do you follow Tyler? Yeah, yeah. religiously. Yeah. <laughs> so Tyler is really good at this, right? So he has this website, Marginal Revolution. And on this website, he talks about restaurants. He talks about history. He talks about, he, he's obviously an economist. He talks about economics. He talks about politics. He talks about art. He talks about everything. And he has no problem just letting loose and talking about all these things. And I often disagree with him, but it's really interesting. Every, you know, he's got an interesting perspective. He, he, he's always looking at this in, in ways that you don't hear anywhere else. And it causes you to think. And even if you disagree with him, it's interesting to figure out why you disagree with him. Um, so I don't know how to, I mean, my show in a sense capitalizes on that because I cover everything. But I do tend to gravitate to the comfort zone, which is politics and economics. Um, but I think, I think actually, if I was more eclectic like Tyler, maybe I could actually broaden the audience over time. And, and I'm still struggling with this. I don't have enough confidence to do a show on something that I'm not 100% convinced I'm an expert on. But I, well, I mean, sure. that's, that's very along. The, so th this goes to my point of about people are persuaded by people. So you can think about it two stages. One is, oh, this is a person worth listening to. And once you're interested, if you think about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon, it's possible to take too much away from that. But the, what people get grabbed, they initially got grabbed by this idea of, oh, he's taking a brave stand and saying interesting things about political correctness on campus. But then it was, he has interesting things to say about everything. And, and then I'm interested in him and want to hear what he has to say about everything. And I think the same thing happened to Ayn Rand. Yep. Oh, she wrote these really powerful books. But then you would go to Ford Hall Forum and she would give a talk like, what is capitalism? And all the questions would be about everything under the sun, almost never about yep. anything in the talk. And so the real thought leaders uh, that you see who really make an impact on people they come across as uniquely interesting people like Tyler who think about everything in a very surprising and original way. And that becomes like a gravitational pull. And I think you can have the other model, which is very much like I'm the guy on this issue. But what happens is most people start out as the guy on this issue and then they grow into kind of a broader, here's how I look at life. So you could think about somebody like, um, you know, Tim Ferriss started out as like, I'm the productivity guy. I'm going to help you, you know, liberate yourself from work so you can go off and do other things. And then it became basically, here's a guy who takes this really interesting measure and test everything approach to everything in life. And now I want to know what kind of knives he uses to cook with. And I want to know, you know, how he deals with sleep. So I think th there's like, that is how the journey should go. Um, if you're going to be influential, but it's, there's think, not a clear roadmap of how to do it. No. And I think I'm struggling. I think I'm at the point right now. So like, you know, so I, I've got the biggest, whatever following in objectivism or whatever, but that's a small world. And I, and there's a lot of people who are not objectivists who follow me, but it's still, it's still small. You know, I've got, I don't know. It, it's a lot for some 18,500 or something followers on YouTube or whatever, but it's a small fight, you know, compared to Jordan Peterson's millions and, and even a lot of other people who have 100,000 or 500,000. I mean, it, numbers are big. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, what does it take to get from where I am now? Because I've been growing at a low rate of growth for over a year now. What does it take to go to the next level? And it's not marketing. I mean, to some extent, it could be marketing. Yeah, I'm sure I'd get more subscribers, but it's not. It's something about the content has to grow 
has to become viral in some way. And I don't know, I still haven't figured out how to do it or what exactly it is. And I think, and I, and I, I alternate between wanting to specialize, you know, become the guy who attacks the right because it's much more attractive to me than attacking the left. But, but that's too limiting and boring. And I, I, I don't find it interesting enough to do it all the time. Um, but I still, but I don't know what the right balance is in order to get to the point where it really does take off. Um, but that's the challenge. The challenge is how do you broaden the audience in a significant way? Cause I think I'm maxed out on what I do right now. I don't, you know, what I do right now is not going to grow dramatically. Right. So I have to do something different. And what is that something? I'm still not sure. Yeah. I mean, there's in business, there's just this general principle of you'll hit ceilings of growth and each ceiling then requires a real transformation if you're going to keep scaling and that is really scary because you're in effect going blind like you're going back to zero like you're throwing out a bunch of stuff that you know works yep. in order to get to this new level and you don't know if that's going to work and uh so it, i mean it'll be really interesting but i think being aware that that's where you're at is a really good starting point yep. um and and because I agree with you, it's not like man. If we could just get like you're on a really good like you know a Facebook ads guy, the world would change. Like or a nice studio or, or different background things. I mean, they're all valuable, but it's that's not the breakthrough. That's not the yeah, thing. Those are optimizations rather yeah. than transformations. Yeah. And what what so right now, yeah, I'm at the stage where I'm trying to figure out what would what would be a game changer um, or at least a, a, a real accelerator. And I'm not sure what that is. So we'll see. we'll see. Yeah. I mean, that's basically part of my inception for doing this podcast was the, that, uh, you know, I always had these very well laid plans for, I'm going to do this and it will achieve this result in terms of growing an audience, everything. And that never works. So instead I said, well, why don't I just do like the podcast that I would have the most fun possible doing and get the most, you know, personal reward out of. And the worst case scenario is that I get to spend time doing things I really enjoy. So that's kind of my way of approaching this same issue, which is like, I want it to get an audience and be influential but I'm optimizing for personal satisfaction and then just kind of like seeing what happens from there. No, I think that's right. And I mean, you, you got to enjoy whatever you do anyway, that is otherwise you shouldn't do it. But uh, if you're not sure it's going to be successful, if you're not sure exactly what the model is, you know, do what you enjoy doing and see that's, that's at least you'll get a, you'll get a data point for any changes you want to make. You'll get a data point. Okay. This succeeds or didn't. And then you'll be able to go on. So, um, but yeah, I know. I think, I think we have these technological tools now that make communicating unbelievably easy and or easier. And to an audience that we couldn't even imagine we could have just a few years ago. So it's it's the world has changed in in profound ways because of YouTube and because of Zoom and because of all these things and. I think people are still trying to figure out how to use them and also figure out what the secret is behind a Jordan Peterson. I don't think it's clear, right? It's, it's uh, what, what actually allowed him to become as big as he, as he became. Um, yeah. And contrasting it with other people who have done it, uh, I think is important because you want to think like how Tyler got, cause he's you know, not quite as famous, but he's widely known outside of economics and, uh, and so that, you know, finding those sort of data points and calling through them. Well, it's interesting because, you know, most of the people I know who've got into that stage or at least got into some stage like that basically became well-known within a field and then or, or became established within a field and then took that and, and broadened it dramatically. So Tyler, I've known about Tyler for 20 years, right? He was this economist that, George Mason was a good economist and he wrote and he did good stuff. And then, yeah, and he did some restaurant reviews at some point. And, but then like over the last, I'd say five, six, seven years, he's just become much bigger as he took that restaurant review stuff and expanded it to be this eclectic thinker in economics who thinks about everything uh, from that perspective. Um, 
with no marketing effort, just a good website, just a good kind of a certain, and he's not very, I mean, what differentiates Tyler, for example, from a lot of the other examples, he has no charisma. He's not a charismatic person. He has no stage presence. Um, person to person, he's kind of awkward. He's shy. You know, he's not, he doesn't have the Jordan Peterson thing. He's, he's just created a great website, you know, and he's created a, a great, identity through that website well that's why i always thought sam harris is in many ways a, another good yep. model because you want it's nice to pick people who aren't uniquely like charismatic or something like that unless you yourself are uniquely charismatic yep. uh to model from well you're on this has been a yeah I mean, sam sam is, is really fascinating because he's he, he's and i don't know again it's it's hard to tell what differentiates him from other kind of laid back calm well-spoken people what makes sam different from all those others but there's something about him and something the way about the way he expresses himself and again i think there's something about the fact that you get a sense that he cares there's some there's something very value driven about sam harris even though he's so mellow he's still you know it's important to him you know what's important to him well i think it's uh, I, with him i think it's that he has a very definite brand, which is that I care about nothing more than the rigorous pursuit of the truth. Yes. And, and, and part of the dispassionate nature of the way that he'll approach things yep. is conveying, yep. uh, you know, I'm going to really be methodical in thinking this through in, you know, giving the best arguments to my opposition and so in a certain way, he's made that work in his favor. Yep. Um, but, and so it, it, it's, you do get the deep passion for the, uh, not passionless, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, for the, uh, uh, yeah, you, you get, uh, you get his passion for reason in a sense, right? Yeah. You, the important reason plays in his life, but also happiness. Cause you know, I love it when he's talking about being in the moment and being happy and, you know, and he, he, he really does have that. He conveys authenticity that he really cares about this and he cares about the audience caring about this. And it's, again, it's not some removed theoretical. Um, I mean, he gets a little theoretical sometimes and that's when he loses people. But, but I think when he's, when he's talking about living and he's talking about applying these ideas to life, then I think that's when he's uh, at his best. And, there, you know, and there, it's interesting to look at all of them one by one and see what makes them. Uh, unique uh, and and but also what makes them so popular um, yeah something to strive towards <laughs> awesome well thanks Sharon. hopefully we sure. can do this again at some point if you want to support the show the best way you can do it is sign up for our email list at donswriting.com where you'll also get my week-long persuasion boot camp email course you can also support the show financially by going to libertyunlock.com and clicking on the support button Every dollar goes to improving the show and helping us reach as many people as possible. And now